Today, uh, for this session, we're going to be learning a bit more about plugins, how to uh, build them, ship them, store them, and run them. And we'll be learning that from Nantini, uh, an engineering manager on the Docker Store team. Uh, she's managing the team building Docker Store and working with some of the ecosystem partners, uh, which some of you may very well be. And it's, it's really pretty cool to note that she's actually designed and built the house that she's living in right now. So like truly an architect, right? Not just a I software tried. architect, but also an architect architect. And this is Tibor here, software engineer on the Docker engine team. He's one of the open source maintainers, so you might recognize his name from you know, some of the open source repos uh, or, or maybe uh, you know, some of the GitHub issues. And he's been recently working on the plugins, hence his involvement in the session here. And uh, interesting to note that he speaks both French and Hungarian, so when you're asking your questions at the end, you can speak it in French or Hungarian if you like, and, and Tibor, Tibor's got you. And, and speaking of questions at the end, uh, we'll leave somewhere uh, between five and ten minutes at the end for questions. I'd ask that you actually come to the front here. I'll have uh, mics on the chairs, uh, and if you'd speak into the mic for your question so we can capture the audio uh, for the recording later for everyone's benefit. And, and one last reminder here, uh, at the end of the session, please do go into the, the app, the DockerCon app, and vote for the session. And the top rated sessions you know, will be replayed tomorrow as well, the ones, and those are the ones that, that you all choose by voting in the app. So without further ado, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and uh, welcome to the breakout session on plugins. Today we'll talk about how you can build and leverage plugins as a developer, operator, or an enterprise consumer or publisher. We expect the audience to have a basic understanding of how you can use your Docker files to create a container, run a container, if you haven't done so already, and if you know, want to know how to do this, then you can go ahead and do the hands-on labs that's downstairs, and uh, subsequently plugins. A quick show of hands. Who here has worked with or heard of plugins so far? Okay, oh, nice. that's, that's good. So we hope the session is actually useful. Let's start with the why. Why do we even need plugins in the first place? Docker provides some common components like volumes, network, and logging, which are extremely useful and also has some defaults for them. Now, Docker alone obviously cannot cover the entire setup matrix. There will always be a need for customization and extending Docker's existing functionalities. This also chimes in very well with our philosophy of building components that have batteries included, but are swappable. Let's look at an example. Here's uh, an example setup where you have a container that wants to persist data, so you mount a volume locally on your node. Now, what if you wanted to persist the data outside your node? Enter a volume plugin. So in this case, a developer could have a hardware that was sourced from elsewhere, and you could use a volume plugin to connect to the hardware from your container. Note that this eliminates the need to hard code how to communicate and leverage with your hardware within your application. You can use a volume plugin. Starting Docker 1703, plugins have become first class citizens. What this means is that you can manage the end to end life cycle of a plugin via your Docker CLI. As of now, we have five interfaces defined, authorization, network, volume, IPAM, and logging. And now, Tibor's gonna come over and talk about how you can build these plugins and about the interfaces that we support. Over to you. Thank you, Nandini. So first of all, um, I'm gonna start with a quick example uh, running a volume plugin specifically. So remember, you have five categories of plugins in this, in this case, we're going to take the example of a volume plugin, and more specifically, um, an SSHFS volume plugin. Uh, for those of you who might not know what SSHFS is, it's a file system client 
uh, to mount and interact with the remote directories and files. Uh, it uses the Fuse device um, to, um, to, inter to have a file system on, in the user space and uses the SSH protocol um, to, um, to communicate with the remote server. Uh, the source code is available on GitHub at libfuse slash sshfs, and my colleague Victor Vio created a plugin for this, uh, for, uh, for this program, and the source code is also available on GitHub at vio slash docker volume sshfs, and we'll look into how it's built later on. So let's jump in a quick demo here. Let me know if it's big enough. So first of all, we need a, we need a server. So uh, let's dive in there and, oh, nice. Sorry about that. Um, there you go. So here I have a folder. I have a, I have a folder and I have a file named DockerCon and there's a little text just uh, for the demo. So now we have our uh, server set up. Um, I want to show you that how you can, uh, how you can interact uh, with that, how you can install a plugin using that. So first of all, I want to show you that a Docker plugin why do we say it's first class citizen? It's because we have a plugin sub command um, that allows you to manage the lifecycle uh, and it manage the plugin itself. Plugins since 1703 are containers themselves. They're running with container D, and um, you can, yeah, basically they're containerized and you can manage them with the plugin CLI. So there's a quick output here, and we're going to go ahead and install the plugin I just showed you here. Let me know if you can't see it. So what this is going to do is it's going to fetch a config file that has a list of permissions that the plugin requests uh, the operator. The reason we want this is because we don't want plugins when you install them to right away access anything on your host. So we want to make sure that it's secure by default and that you can, uh, you can review the permissions before accepting it. In this case, it needs access to the host network to uh, uh, mount a, um, uh, a path on the host to bind mount it inside the plugin container. It needs access to the Fuse device so that it can, do, uh, it can mount and just as well it needs Linux capability, Capsys admin in order to mount inside the container. Well, I know the code, I reviewed it, I uh, trust these uh, privileges, so I'm going to go ahead and install it. So right now it's basically pulling, pulling the layer, and if I look, there it is. It's installed and it enabled. It's already running. So let's verify that this is actually a volume plugin. So I can do that with Docker inspect. And here, you see interface, and this here is what tells it that it's a volume drive, it's a volume plugin. It implements this uh, named interface. We also, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but you also need to specify the name of the socket, the Unix socket, uh, used to communicate with Docker. Uh, but more on that later. Now let's go ahead and, I'm sorry, let me, Arrange this a little better. Um, look at the volumes we have. We have nothing. And I th think I have this in my history here. It will be quicker. Um, so I want to create a volume. I do that by, with volume create. I need to specify the driver, dash D is for driver. Um, the driver's name is the plugin's name. So vues slash sshfs. And then I need to pass in some options a dash for options. So I need to specify the uh, SSH, uh, the, the server itself, the user using that server, uh, a path inside that server that we want to expose as a volume. Uh, some credentials, a port, that's actually optional. Uh, in this case, if it's uh, 22, 
the port 22, and a name for your volume. So here I go ahead and I created my volume. And it's there. Now you need to mount that volume, obviously. Otherwise, it's kind of useless. So um, let me go ahead and I named it my SSH volume, and I'm going to mount it inside slash remote inside the container. I'm going to just take a BusyBox container just to look around. And it succeeded. It mounted. So now if I look in remote, I see my DockerCon from the server, and it's in there. So this was, uh, this was basically for the uh, happy case. Let me switch back to the slides real quick. So very quickly what you saw is just how to use, how to interact with a plugin that works, uh, again, in the happy case. Um, quick takeaways. The way to install a plugin is with plugin install, the name of your plugin. You review the permissions, and if you're, uh, if you're fine with them, you just accept them. Uh, finally, you need to use that, um, that plugin. In this case, we used Volume Create because it's a volume plugin. Obviously, if your plugin is a network plugin, you would have to interact uh, uh, the way networks are supposed to interact with network plugins. In this case, it would be Docker Network Create. Um, authorization plugins interact differently. Um, et cetera, et cetera. All, all of the details are in the documentations online. Um, so in this case, we created a volume, and then you need to mount that volume. So just want to make sure that's uh, clear. So that was a happy case. And what about when things don't work? So let me go back to my laptop here. So let's remove, let's remove what we did. And let's recreate it. But this time, maybe you'll see it better this way. This time, instead of a, a good password, we're going to type in a bad one. So it won't work. Notice that the volume creation worked. It's because there is no, um, there's no communication with the server at creation of the volume uh, in the case of SSHFS. Uh, it happens during the mount operation. So let, let's try again and mount it. And now you see an error. So how do you debug this? The number one takeaway of how to debug a plugin is by logs. So you tail the logs and you look for plugin equals and ideally the ID of your plugin. In this case, I have only one, so it should be all right. So let me try again. And now you see, let me put this bigger in case you don't see it. You see connection reset by peer. So this is an indication in this case that SSH, the SSH client inside the plugin container could not access the remote host. So I could like log on again the, the host machine, the, sorry, the remote host, look at the auth, auth logs, see that the password was wrong. Um, and understand what was, what was wrong with my plugin. Now, what else could you do to debug a plugin? Something I want to show you as well is, um, in the case the plugin author created a way of adjusting the verbosity of, your, uh, of the plugin, um, that's via uh, plugin settings. So let me show, let me show you that. Um, in this case, my, Victor created a debug setting that we can set to one. So if I, if I do Docker plugin set, there you go, Docker plugin set the name of the plugin and set debug equals to one. Actually, we need to disable it. If we set it to one, um, and re-enable it. Sorry. Let me recreate the plugin real quick with a bad password. And let me mount it again. 
In this case, we already know what the problem is, but I just want to show you how much more verbose it is. So this is a way of um, this is a way of um, adjusting a ver the verbosity of a plugin in the only case where the plugin author made it so. Um, so I want to be clear that you cannot just add debug equals one to any plugin. Um, what I'm trying to showcase here is the the ability to set settings on plugins. So now that this is done, um, oh yeah, one last thing for debugging a plugin, which is in the case where you really have no visibility on what's wrong, even though you, you, you looked at the logs. Um, it's a pro tip, basically. It's if you have the, the ID of the plugin, but the short ID is not enough, so you need the whole ID here. If you have that, actually let me go back here, you can exec into the container like so. Remember I said plugins are containers. They're, they're using container D, which uses run C. So if, uh, if you look at the uh, list of containers running, you would see your plugin container in the, sorry, if you look at the list of run C containers run, running, you would, see, um, you would see our plugin. So if I exec inside that, I can run a, any process. It's ob obviously it's very convenient to run a shell command. And here I'm inside my plugin, I can, uh, I can do, I can look around, see what, what's, what's the view of the world from inside the plugin. So, yeah. Basically, if you're debugging a plugin, the takeaway is always checking the daemon logs. That's where you would see the output of the plugin. Um, if the author created a, um, created a setting, then you can, you can set those, set, those verbosity settings. And finally, this pro tip of entering a container um, entering a plugin container to debug. Yeah, I just made the recap. So that's in the that's in the case where you already have a plugin, but we want to we want to um, we want to also know how to build one in the first place. So before before I dive into another demo. Uh, we need to understand how plugins are uh, constituted in the first place. So uh, since I said a plugin is a container, it needs a root FS. And this is regardless of whether it's a volume plugin, network plugin, or anything. It's a container, it needs a root FS. Uh, another thing it needs is a description, and a uh, JSON description, that defines, first of all, what interface it, uh, um, it implements, that I showed you earlier in Docker Inspect, and also what permissions it needs. There's a, I, I linked a, a link, I added a link to the reference for this description, but we'll go uh, in a little detail for this use case. How does it work? Um, what needs to be understood is the plugin itself does not make calls. The plugin itself will listen on a Unix socket, and it's Docker itself that will make the calls. The calls are HTTP. Um, or HTTP JSON, uh, it's an HTTP JSON API basically, and um, and the, the the way it does it is basically it's bind mounting run the slash run slash Docker slash plugins the plugin ID, and inside the container it's slash run slash Docker slash plugins. That's a directory in which the Unix socket is expected to be. If it's not there, then it will time out, and you'll see an error. So um, so yeah, all you have to do as a plugin container is listen under a socket on, in slash run slash docker slash plugins. So then the next thing you have to do is, um, so now we understood how it works, you have to know which of the plugins you want to implement. So there is documentation for each of those. These documentations are uh, like HTTP JSON, and um, 
in the case you created you, your plugin in the Go programming language, we created a, um, a helper package for you. It's available at uh, github.com slash docker slash go plugins helpers. And in our case, we're going to use the volume sub package that's very helpful. I'll show you in a second. So here, I checked out the uh, vol SSH volume plugin, um, the SSH FS volume plugins source code from GitHub. And um, let us look at the main file. Like I showed you here, we're importing our helper package. We're setting, uh, we're specifying the path for the socket to be listened on. And real quick, I just want to show you the main function. Here. Volume.newHandler, and you pass in an object that, it spec that implements a spe specific interface. I'll show you in a second. And you do H that handler, you, on that handler you call serve Unix and the socket address. It's that easy. So now if I look at what kind of object this is, it's basically this uh, private struct, and this struct implements an interface. You can see the me methods implementations here. I can show you the interface uh, right here. This is the, a this is the um, HTTP API, API's documentation, in case you didn't want to use our helper package or that it's in another language. So you have the, all the documentation for all of these. And here you have the plugins helper package. And finally, our, specifically our volume sub package. Let me put this bigger so you can see. This driver interface is all you need to uh, implement and go to, uh, to basically have a, a plugin, a volume plugin, sorry. So, that's what, that's what this main.go function, uh, main.go file does. Path, mount, etc. So, this is our, this was our code for the plugin. Now I wanna also show you, um, I wanna also show you the config. Um, Again, like I said, the most important part is this interface. Specifies the name of the socket and the type of plugins, uh, plugin types you want to implement. Then you have all sorts of uh, settings like uh, capab Linux capabilities, devices. All of these will result in um, prompting the, like some of these will result in prompting the user for permissions. Uh, we need to mount uh, some state and we need to um, uh, yeah, specify network, uh, network host. I want to quickly touch on propagated mount, which is a uh, special setting, I mean, a very useful setting for volume plugins in particular. The reason you need this for volume plugins specifically is because the plugin being a container, doing a mount inside the container that mount point, those mount points are not visible outside. Therefore, you need to be able to propagate that mount outside uh, so that Docker can see it and can mount it properly inside your uh, user container. So, finally, uh, like I said, it has to be a container, so it needs, uh, it needs a way to build. So here we're using Go, so we're just, uh, we're just uh, installing, compiling the main.go program, and finally we're running, we're running the uh, compiled, uh, compiled executable. So let me go ahead and build it. Wow, that was fast. That was thanks to caching, of course. Um, it's because I ran it earlier. So now we have a. Docker image that's named SSHFS.
right here. And what we need to do is we need to extract the root of s. The way you can do that is, uh, first of all, let's, let's create a directory here. So I'm creating a plugin directory and a rootfs directory inside that. And I need to, I need to extract the rootfs of my image. The way I can do that is uh, docker container create, the name of my image. Um, let, let me name this container just uh, TMP for now. Um, there you go. And now, I can export the rootfs of the container that has been created. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to untar it inside rootfs. This will take a little while. And so now if I go in my plugin directory, I see rootfs and inside there I should see, I should see the rootfs of, uh, of my image. So, Right. Inside my plugin directory, I need, like I said, the plugin has two things. It's a rootfs and a config file. So we just need to copy over our config file here. And now we have a directory that's ready to be built into a, into a plugin. So all I need to do is plugin create the name of my plugin. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fork his plugin. And basically a path to a path to a directory that has a rootfs dir and a config.json. The reason this is taking some time is because I try to simplify the demo for you. I showed you only one Docker file. And this Docker file has a lot of build artifacts. In, uh, if you remember from the keynote, one, uh, one great new feature we have in the builder is a uh, multi-stage build. And so we could modify this Docker file and uh, make it so that it removes all the uh, build time dependencies. Um, but because, uh, b because that's still in the, I think, edge release, um, Victor still uh, still uses two Docker files, so I can show you. I can show you the master branch here. You see two Docker files. Um, this one is the minimal one, but it expects to have a binary built. Um, let me show you the rootfs size without uh, without this optimization. It's uh, it's quite quite big, and so if I. Um, if I recreate the plugin with the optimization, um, with the optimization, it should uh, it should be much smaller. Um, the reason I'm using the make file is because all the commands I just typed in, you can. Uh, uh, Victor created a make file to make that more convenient. So. Very soon, this should, re I think it, it is rebuilding right now. Anyway, you got the gist of it. So what I can also do Never mind. OK, I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's the internet that's a bit slow right now. So I just want to show you that here I created my uh, tibervas uh, slash sshfs plugin. I also have the previous one. And I'm just going to go ahead and push it to the hub, um, although I already did it. And given the slow connection, I think this will be. Anyway, you can see it working. It's just going to be a bit slow. <laughs> yeah, that'll take a while. All right, so um, let me. Go back to the slides. Right, so to build a plugin, 
to build a plugin, you need to uh, spec you need to uh, first of all select what kind of plugin you want to implement, uh, and uh, you need to create you need to first create a container since plugins are containers. So you need most likely a Docker file. You need to uh, extract the rootfs from it, and then with plugin create, so just showing a directory that has a rootfs and the config, you're ready to go. And now I'm gonna give back the mic to okay. Nandini. Thanks, Tibor. So, so far we've seen how you can build and uh, debug your plugin. Let's look into how you can collaborate and then distribute your plugin. The plugin push command that Tibor just demoed, which I think is still pushing, eventually pushes it to the public registry, which is also called Docker Hub, which is the world's largest collection of images or Docker images. Uh, you can view your, the plugin metadata that was pushed on a UI by going to cloud.docker.com. Here's a screenshot. Uh, let's talk a bit about what we're even looking at here. So we've pushed the SSH FS plugin into a different namespace to demonstrate how you could collaborate on this plugin with other members in your organization and teams. Uh, some of the metadata here is uh, the name of the plugin that we've pushed is DockerCon 17 plugin slash SSHFS. The little puzzle icon that you will see there demonstrates that this is a plugin type repo, and it looks like this was, was pushed six days ago. I think that was when we made the slides. Uh, the lock symbol indicates that the plugin is a part of a private repository, which means that members with access alone can view or update the contents. Once you click into this, you get a set of tabs which represents different kinds of metadata, which again is viewable by people depending on whether they have read, write, or admin permissions. This is a representation of how uh, it looks like in this repo, the read-only team has been given read-only permissions, so any member of this team will be able to do a Docker plugin install and run the plugin. The settings tab helps you uh, toggle the visibility settings between uh, from public to private and vice versa. If you're an admin, you should be able to just get rid of all the repo metadata and the bits by pressing the delete button. Probably the most important uh, tabs uh, tab in here is the tags tab, which is the majority use case. This gives you a list of all the tags that were pushed to your repo. And given that this is a private repository, we also have Docker security scanner turned on. So in this case, it looks like the demo tag that was pushed six days ago uh, does not have any critical vulnerabilities, which is a good thing. Once you drill down into the actual detail of what you wanna see, you get a list of components that are part of this image. And from, in, from here, it looks like the Picre component has five major vulnerabilities, uh, which, uh, all of which seem fairly recent. Moving on to how you can distribute plugins. The private repository that you just set up was one way to distribute your plugins. There are two other avenues. You can share your plugins publicly, which means that any user with or without a Docker identity can discover and use your plugin. These are also called community plugins. And we've seen three screens ago how you can actually toggle the settings. Uh, this is a screenshot of how you can search for Victor's plugin on store.docker.com. Uh, so what you'll be able to do is you can search for the plugin, you can click into the plugin itself, and then look at details or documentation that Victor would have added at some point about how you can install the plugin you'll be able to look at the list of tags and then actually go ahead and install the plugin. If your plugin is a plugin that you're developing as part of an enterprise, you'd wanna check out the publisher certification program on Docker Store. This was also talked about in the keynote and we are also going to talk about this in much more detail at 3.45 in this ballroom. So you should definitely check out that session if, if you're interested. The Docker Store is a scalable, two-sided marketplace that we've built over the last one year. We've built this leveraging our experience, maintaining the world's largest public registry, and the official images program, 
which constitutes 20% of all the pulls that we see on the registry right now. As part of STORE, we've created a platform for individuals, SMBs, and large-scale enterprises to offer their content. It could be free or commercial. For consumers, whether it is developers, operators, or enterprise consumers, we've created an enhanced search and discovery experience so that you get exactly what you're looking for. If you've created standalone content, or if you have a plugin that can be offered to your consumers in conjunction with, say, hardware or software that your consumer is entitled to via store or Docker or any other channel, the Docker Store Publisher program is a good fit. And submitting your content is as simple as signing up, actually having a plugin that you'd want to submit, and adding other pieces of metadata for, uh, with, along with your submission. This is an overview of how your publisher page would look like once you have one or more products that you have uh, that are in the process of submission. In this case, it looks like Mystery Mind is live on the store, and Black Wolf and NanoSync are still products that you're working on, and uh, Socket has been rejected, which means that it has moderation feedback that needs to be acted upon and resubmitted so that we, store administrators, can look at it and reapprove it if everything is good. And these products look pretty, pretty interesting. I'd love to see them on the store. Also, as uh, publishers of Docker Store, depending on certain criteria you meet, you get a view of the analytics that we collect on behalf of you for all, the public, for all the consumers that are eventually gonna use your product. This is a future UI that we're developing right now, but as of now, we offer pull reports and sales reports for publishers that meet certain criteria. It's mostly around whether or not you have commercial and certified content. Moving on to the enterprise consumer use case. If you're an enterprise consumer and you want plugins that are certified, you can go to the store and look into the plugins tab and just check the Docker certified button uh, checkbox. You'd get a list of certified plugins, which means that these plugins come with a joint statement of support from Docker and the publisher. So if and when you have any issue with this plugin, you will have someone to talk to and someone that can help make sure that you are unblocked. This also comes with uh, a verified installation on Docker Enterprise Edition, and we guarantee that this plugin will be supported for the next one year's worth of Docker EE releases. So to recap, we talked about how you can build, debug, distribute, and consume plugins. We hope you found this session useful. And uh, if you did, please go ahead and uh, go into the app and give feedback so that we can talk about this again tomorrow. The, here's some documentation and uh, uh, pointers about what you want to do if there are next steps that you'd like to take. So there's docs.docker.com that you can look at for any API interfaces. If you're a plugin consumer, you can go ahead to Docker Store and look at all the plugins that you'd like to use. And if you would want to put, set up a PR and contribute, then you can always go to github.com mobi slash mobi, which was just announced yesterday, and contribute. Uh, it looks like we still have some time, so we'd love to answer any questions that you might have. First of all, thank you very much. <laughs> so yeah, if you have questions, please come to the front. I just wanted to start with one comment. Um, Thank you so much for this work. Uh, I, I kind of wrote up a blog post prior to the way this this new way of uh, building and distributing plugins, and it was there was a fair amount of hackery involved, and, and there wasn't much documentation around it. Very painful. Thank you for making it so much easier. This this stuff is great. Let's uh, start with a question. Hi. Thanks. Uh, it looked like uh, it was pretty easy to build and then push. I'm assuming uh, private registry support is there. Am I able to I'm just sorry, tag it? Hold sorry. it not closer. Um, I'm wondering if private registry support is there so we can push plugins to a private registry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Uh, is there a specific version of like the Docker registry that's needed to support that, or does it just treat it as image blobs manifest, et cetera? Uh, so I think it's uh, the registry uh, DDC release that was released along with 1703. I forget if it's UCP 2.1 or 2.2. Uh, it should be a recent release, but that should support uh, uh, plugins on your private registry. Are you, are you talking about uh, the uh, open source version? Yes, yeah. Um, right, I believe, so all we need to, to do is just specify a media type for plugins, but I believe the latest version should handle that. It, um, I mean, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not correct, just, uh, um, you can, we can handle that offline and I'll let you know. Okay, thanks. First of all, uh, thank you for the talk and the renewed efforts of uh, documenting uh, how to build plugins because a few months ago it was not so easy and a lot of uh, head scratching. Um, so I've noticed there's been a bit of bias towards uh, any kind of storage plugins and you don't really talk a whole lot about authentication or the other plugins that are available. Right. Um, I was hoping to get some more of that today uh, okay. or at least on the documentation. Again, I haven't looked at the new latest stuff. but. Um, like what benefits or expectations would you have from other non-storage based plugins? Right, we, I believe we do have a, um, a uh, example authorization plugin as well. Um, uh, if it's not in the documentation, we should add it for sure. Um, again, I can, we, if you have more questions uh, offline, because I know there's not that much time, um, about specifically authorization, is it, that what you're interested in? Not specifically, but more or less. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of interest in trying to build, you know, uh, storage plugins, but like not, you're not get garnering much interest towards anything that's non-storage based. So you know, there's there's no uh, direction on what you should be doing outside of storage. It seems like for anybody wanting to build plugins. Right. Well, I think what this talk was uh, trying to convey is the fact that you can now manage these plugins regardless of what type they are. And so we had to pick one that's uh, pretty, I mean, we, we couldn't have just demoed all of them. Uh, and all of them have specifics. Um, obviously, oh. Docker, network, Docker uh, plugin networks have specifics as well. So um, yeah, if you have, if you have uh, specific questions about certain types of plugins, uh, we, you can ask me later and I'll find you the right person for that. So we're, we're at time, we do need to wrap up. Let's take w one more from the mic, um, but then uh, any questions after that, you can maybe uh, come down sure. and, and I'll, field I'll those around. on the floor yeah, here. Yeah. And if there are other members of your team uh, who, are, who are knowledgeable about plugins as well, then you know, maybe they can help you out. So one last question. So the, uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the process of uh, building an image, then creating a container and extracting the root of S and copy and config, it seems a little clunky. Can you explain sort of the motivation to, behind the design of that process? Um, it's a good question. Actually, I think we're, we're planning on improving that process. We, uh, I don't remember exactly why it's this way, um, but I definitely, I th at some point we had some designs that would just have a plugin instruction in a Docker file. Uh, so that might be one way of uh, improving it. But really all contributions are welcome. So if you have, uh, if you have good ideas on how to improve that process, um, feel free to reach out. Okay, thanks so much everyone. Final reminder to please vote for the session in the DockerCon app. And thanks again.